I am Emma Toots. I am the co-founder and executive chair of American Warriors here at the, at the business club. Um, you can't see the banner very well because of the lighting, but the American Warriors is one of the special interest groups here at the club. And um, Andrew Marks, right up there, is our master of ceremonies and is also a member of the club. He is part of the American Warriors Executive Committee because he is one of our club leaders. Um, he's the club leader of the American Warriors up in the Northland Club. So next slide, the agenda. I'm gonna do a quick introduction of American Warriors. Um, do a recognition of our sustaining sponsors. Some of their information um, has, uh, has been browsed back there in the, uh, in the table information fair. And then I'll bring up Andrew, who will introduce our, our speakers in turn and will be our timekeeper for our uh, guest speaker program. After the transition stories, I will present on solving the transition puzzle, which is um, a little bit of the work that we do in um, American Warriors as well as in my work um, in Two's Consulting. Andrew and I will start wrapping up the event with more recognition and gifts. And then after the formal program, you're all welcome to stick around, um, socialize some more, uh, ask questions of the speakers or of the sponsors, and of course, just have fun. We have the club space until Brian decides to pick us out. So if you don't know who Brian is, Brian is the general manager of this Overland Park Club. All right. Next slide. American Warriors is a special interest group here at the club. I mentioned that. Um, and the club, if you're not familiar with the ACA Business Club, it's a private club whose purpose is focused on the understanding that business flows out of relationships. So people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. And so members of the club are committed to creating solid relationships through strategic networking and the fundamentals of relationship building. American Warriors is uh, open to any club member. And that person does not have to have served. They just have to, you know, have have affinity to the people who have or are patriotic and who isn't patriotic, right? So the mission statement of American Words is that we provide educational and networking opportunities for patriotic citizens who are leaders in business and support the transition into private and public sector opportunities and business for active duty service members and first responders. The American Warriors Group conducts regular activities every month, um, different levels of engagement, and the banner, you can't see it like I said, um, we have a monthly facilitated discussion group that can be attended in person here at this club. Uh, I hold it there in the conference room, but there's also opportunities for people to attend virtu uh, virtually with Zoom. The Purple Connection is another opportunity for American Warriors and members of the community, the military support community, to engage and learn from each other as far as educational networking. There is a panel program of organizational representatives as well as a transition tip speaker each, each month. And then this is going to be a semi-annual event. It's going to be a social and guest speaker program. And then individual support as applicable by people who are involved in the group. We welcome any participation from members of the club and then invitations to people who are not members but are part of the military support um, or military communities to be uh, part of our events as guests. Next slide. Our uh, sustaining sponsors are those who have committed to supporting this event, the inaugural event, and then also future iterations of our social and guest speaker program because they have personal or organizational affinity and uh, energy for supporting American Warriors. Because of their commitment and uh, support in our American Warriors mission, I have a gift for each of them. So um, could someone help me with the gifts? Um, with that, each of our sponsors are going to receive a utility tote from from me. It's a I have a business that's called 
gem. Gifts by Emma, 31 gifts. So these are, these are utility totes that are as patriotic in design as they are in their values and actions. So let me just introduce who these folks are. Andrew, you get one. And um, just to show you what this looks like, it's kind of a star-spangled utility tote um, for being a sustaining sponsor of American Warriors. Sweet new beach bag. All right, uh, Sharon Keller with Keller Williams <laughs> Realty Partners. Thank you. Mark Thompson of Western Governors University. Scott Weaver of the Greater Kansas City Chapter of the Association of the U.S. Army. You're welcome. And B.J. Taylor of B.J. Productions, our DJ. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to turn over the microphone to Andrew, and we will get going on our guest speaker program. <coughs> Thank you, Emma. Real quick, I just want for everybody to give Emma a huge round of applause. <laughs> this is her dream that she had. I just think she did a really good job in just organizing this and just um, yeah, getting this all together. So, can't thank you enough, Emma. So, we will be hearing from a few uh, speakers this uh, evening. So, our first speaker is Mel Carney. A, female, a Vietnam combat veteran. His transition story includes coming home after service in Vietnam to a society that not, did not appreciate him and personal transition challenges with the physical <laughs> and emotional events of war. He'll share his remarks of how he overcame his transition challenges and found a new purpose in writing. CA that you go into is called a hot LZ, hot landing zone. That means you're taking, you know, AK-47, 30 caliber, or RPGs, rocket from bell grenades. When you jump off that helicopter, and sometimes you may you may jump off from five feet. But the first thing you want to do is get, get the hell away from the chopper because <laughs> now it's drawing fire. And that's why we lost so many cho you know, chopper pilots over there. I mean, these guys were phenomenal. Uh, and they, they just come in and get you. I don't care what they mean. They just, they really, I mean, they, they saved our life time and time and time again. Without those guys, we wouldn't have made it. I was born in, uh, in Millersburg, Iowa in, in uh, 1942, uh, grew up on a farm outside of Millersburg and uh, so then graduated from Millersburg High School and uh, went off to St. Ambrose College in 1960. In 1960 the Vietnam War had really been going on for about six years and after uh, college uh, I found I couldn't get a job because I was 1A which means you're leaving for the military very soon. The drill and ceremony was a snap compared to PT. PT stands for physical training, if you hadn't guessed. Then I went to, uh, I went in the Army. Uh, so they uh, get inducted to Chicago. Well, the sergeant, he said, why don't you go into OCS? And I said, I don't know what that is. Officer Candidate School, I said, okay, well, I don't know what that is either. <laughs> Uh, that's how I ended up eventually going to Officer Candidate School. That was 66, and I'm in uh, basic training for Raleigh, Kansas. And then they sent me to Fort Ord, California for advanced infantry training in California. And then after Fort Ord, they sent me down to Camp Hunter Liggett. And so I was there for three months, and I, they finally came. Then one day, the, the, the end came, and they sent me orders to 
uh, OCS, and I, I went to OCS in Fort Benning, Georgia for the next six months. And in, uh, I graduated in uh, June of 1967. So I came out of Officer Candidate School as a second lieutenant, in the uh, infantry second lieutenant, and I was assigned as an executive officer of a basic training unit in Fort Polk, Louisiana. I got my orders then down for uh, Vietnam of 1967 and then we left on February the 3rd for Vietnam. I was an assigned as a platoon leader, Company B, 1st and 6th Infantry, 198th Light Infantry Brigade, which was part of the AmeriCal Division. You, you've got a 99.44% chance of being a platoon leader. You're going to be in the field. So I got there on uh, February the 4th. Tet started on the 1st. I came into Da Nang and spent the first night, which was February the 4th, watching them trying to blow up Da Nang. The next day, I, I, got, I went over and they were going to fly me to, back to Chu, or down to Chulai, where, where, where the Marical was. Then I caught up with these guys on the 13th. They came out of there, flew to LZ Baldy. That's where I was. I was there for three or four days. And then my unit came in, and then we went and we did our first combat assault. And uh, I have a picture of myself. Someone took a picture of me. I, I was sitting on a front stoop. And when I got into the village, uh, Sergeant Casey, I mean, he said, stay with me. And there was a, a tree there. That tree had straw tied to it. And Sergeant Casey said, stand behind that tree over there. So I went and dutifully stood behind that tree, <laughs> another tree. And he lit, he torched that. And grenades start going off, shells start going off. He said, you don't trust anything in Vietnam. Then we left. We were not much places where there were bills. We spent most of our time out by Laos. Heavy, 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 heavy jungle. If you had to choose the most important event of the Vietnam War, it certainly would be the Tet Offensive. It changed how people looked at the war, and doing so, it changed the war itself. So we, we make it through to uh, April, May, and May 5th is when the world came to an end. 119 places got hit in Vietnam. Uh, we got a call late in the afternoon, and they picked us up for another combat assault, which happened all the time. Uh, that day, we, we, we policed up. Uh, they, they had knocked out two choppers, one, one Huey gunship uh, and then a Huey with a four-man LERP team and knocked them both out of the sky. And the helicopters looked like a, looked like a Tinker Toy set. I mean, I mean that, that's all that was on the ground. We spent uh, the next couple, three days policing the bodies. It's the, probably the only time I actually clocked out. I guess my, my system just just blacked it out. They used a, uh, a Russian, a large Russian gun uh, to knock, knock these guys out. And then three days later, we climbed up Hill 352, then uh, walked into an NVA base camp and knocked out that gun. And there was a lot of NVA out there. I mean, they, 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 they were talking thousands. Then on the third day, the NVA from our area beat him out. That means they left. It was just they were, you know, they wanted to knock out LZ Center because LZ Center had uh, a mixed battery of 155, 175, and 80-inch guns. The whole month of May was just went on like that. And, you know, I got wounded on the 25th. It was supposed to be in an ambush, and they, they screwed it up because you know, we, we got past their ambush, but they had, they'd had they already had mortars already set up, you know, so then they, they brought the mortars in. You know, that, that's when you knew it was an ambush, because it, you know. And we, we lost a man down there, and uh, 
we have a body. We can't get out because it's very high. We're in a, we're a deep valley with big jungle. So we carried the young man to the top of the hill. We got up there and we, they said there was a banana grove there and that maybe we could get the chopper down close enough. So then we brought the chopper in. Now they knew where we were because of the chopper. And they just started raining M60s or 60 millimeter, 60 mic mics down on us. And the motor round must have hit a banana tree. I don't know, but I must have hit a banana tree right here that was just passing. And it blew down on my neck and my shoulders. It took my helmet and, you know, I looked like my helmet was bald. And then it threw me into a tree and knocked me and cold cocked me. Then two guys came back and picked me up. And uh, we got off into the jungle. They finally stopped mortaring us. And then on um, the night of the Castle Hill, that, that was the night of our um, artillery forward observer and his RTO were both killed. We, we got hit 4.30, 5 o'clock, and we're 20 rounds into it, and I know there's no, there's no artillery. I, I ran into the CP, found the Holocaust that was there, and that's when I became an artillery forward observer, you know, for the next five hours. Got the, the radio uh, mic away from the forward observer. He had a death grip on it. And so I, I said, They'll give me three rounds at eight o'clock, and those first three rounds, they they had three rounds of it. But it was just boom, 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 and uh, I fired for pretty much four or five hours. The command at dawn comes from. That's when I found out that I was company commander. Was at dawn. You know, I I did not know that I was that I was the only lieutenant left. We were over by Laos, and they, they brought us back into Chulai. Then you became the Castle Guard. You, you were the last infantry in the field before they get to Chulai. And uh, I've got a picture here of myself with a 130 or 140 rocket uh, that hit our, hit our bunker. I was the only uh, infantryman in, in the division artillery, so I'd go out and check bunkers you know, at, uh, at Chulai. And, Finally, February 4th, 1969, they flew me down to Cameron Bay, the big, huge, massive base. And we're leaving at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. I left on February 4th. I got in Seattle on February 3rd. There was not a single person there from the military. So I'm, I'm in jungle fatigues. I came home in jungle fatigues. And I had three... I had three uh, hippies accost me on, on the way to the one spit at me. I mean, people that look at you, they just, they, you know, they just, they, they lower their eyes, they wouldn't look at you. I mean, it was truly, truly, truly awful. Flew into Cedar Rapids when my mom and dad picked me up and my, you know, my brother and uh, sister. I got home at 10 o'clock at night. I slept 25 hours. Well, they, I, I was at Fort, Fort uh, Leonard Wood, and I got out on August 1st. I think what I brought to my, to my company, to my guys, was somebody who cared, and I would never ask you to do something that I would never do. I mean, I just, I cared that, that, you, that you were alive, and I cared that for you as an individual. Barb and I met at uh, my company commander at Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, was from St. Louis. He, he had me meet Barb when I come in, because I was coming, I was going home, and she, he had asked her when he was home you know, if, if, if I could give her a call. She said yes. So that's how Barb and I met, and that was on, the way to, that was on my way to Vietnam. And uh, when I came back, we, we got together. Uh, you know, Bar Barb and I got married 9-6 of 69 and in St. Louis. And uh, then, so we have three children, uh, Stacy, Pat, and Ryan. And we have six grandchildren. And they are, you know, they, they're, they're from like 21, 22, down to, down to seven. I 
I knew there was something that was not PTSD. I, I think I was having, I think they call it moral injury. Moral injury is you're, go you're going completely against your upbringing. The reason I started it was I wanted to tell my family what, what I'd gone through, what, 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 was, you know, what, what was combat like. And uh, your family doesn't know that, that they can ask you questions about combat, unless you tell them about combat. The problem that we had that I had was that I realized that I had never been able to take pride in what I did. That's what kind of comes from the book. You know that we that we that this was not a this wasn't a, a conflict. This was a damn war, <laughs> and it was serious. And a lot of people got killed. Well, Mel, I'm sure you heard a lot, but thank you for your service as a. Aspiring officer who's commissioning in 14 days, it's men like you that I aspire to be as a leader. So, without further ado, we'd love for you to come forward and kind of bring us up to date a little bit about um, you know, your purposes and um, just how you overcame some of your transitional challenges. My, uh, my transition was several years ago. Uh, I am, I'm now in a position now where I, I retired from, uh, I was in uh, computer software sales for many, many, many years. And I had, uh, uh, when, I came, when I came back, then uh, you know, talk about transition, I don't think that was, if it was in the dictionary, it wasn't in the military dictionary. <laughs> because there was no transition. We were just uh, pretty much when the ripple stopped moving we fell off the ship, then you know, we were gone. And so we went, out, we went out into the world pretty much leading with our chin. I mean, every day you, went, you, you would go up on an interview. And uh, so what I did, I found out, you know, my resume had that I was a, um, that I had been a platoon leader and company commander in Vietnam for the all the interviewer really did was just talk about combat, I want you to talk about combat. And that wasn't why I was there. So I uh, decided that was that wasn't working. So I, re I redid my resume, had my college on there, and I had that I had got my commission from the army, and that was it. I no, I, I had no combat. I didn't, I didn't, I never talked about combat. In fact, I didn't talk about combat for about 45 years. Uh, so it wasn't hard not to talk about combat. And uh, I was given a job by uh, the National Cash Register Company selling cash registers out of Dayton, out of Dayton Ohio. And they trained me in sales, uh, had a, uh, uh, many, many years in, that, in, in, in hardware sales, software sales. And I, I think altogether it was about 47 years you know, I, I spent at, uh, in the sales, the, the whole sales, uh, all my sales career. Uh, gave us a chance to have it. Uh, we had the three children. Uh, they all went to Catholic grade school and high school. Uh, we were able to afford college. So I mean, all of this came because you know you went out and and what I did when when I found out uh, that uh, what I was doing wasn't working, I really started listening real close <laughs> to what people were doing in the industry I was talking to. And you know today, you know my. I, you know, I guess the only thing I'm, I'm, I regret that I'm, I'm not out in the job market because I don't want to be. But today is a really exciting time to be in the, in the job market. It really is because we just we just got through with COVID pretty much, and what that means is that the all the industries, all the companies, are trying to learn what how to live in a post-COVID market. And with Zoom and all the technological things that there that are happening today. Stuff we couldn't even dream about back you know, 25, 30 years ago. Now these companies have got they've, they've got to, they've got to learn how to work in this post-COVID market. And if as a salesperson or as a, anybody going out in the market today, learn how to do that. Learn about everything you can about Zoom, about working with technology, 
and also all the psychology that is happening today that you have to know about as a vendor or as a person working in a, in a uh, working for a company. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I, I got this, I've spent a lot, a lot of time reading and writing about it, and it's really exciting. It really is. I mean, I know that, you know, that uh, everybody out there has their own, has their own, own concepts and own ideas, but if I were out living in, the, in this post-COVID market as a, as a, someone who wanted a job, which I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I would I would work on this then to come round the clock because that's why I got my job in the first place, and then I just simply work people to death. You know, I, I, I could outwork anybody. Just like when you're when you're in the infantry, uh, it's not the strong, it's the strong heart. And when you have a strong heart, you can go and go and go and go. Well, that's what I did in Vietnam. That's what I did here. That's what I did when I came back to Vietnam. And uh, so, as I went out into the out into the into the industry, nobody could outwork me. They just couldn't. Uh, and on top of that, I found out I had PTSD about 45, about forty some years, and that 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 put several layers of issues on it. But again, you just keep you put your head down, and keep working. They, uh, so I have been uh, I've been very fortunate and making it through and. Uh, no, I, I just I wish, like I said, I wish I was young, young enough that I could say I'd want a job, but I don't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. Our next speaker is Zeke uh, Crosser, an Afghanistan combat veteran. His transition story includes coming home after service in Afghanistan to an unexpected medical retirement and personal transition challenges with healing from multiple injuries. Traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress dis disorder, he'll share in his remarks how he overcame his transition challenges and found a new purpose in art. But first we're going to go ahead and play the next uh, Patriot Features film that's going to talk about his backstory. So many other guys that I served with, and girls, did so much more than, than what I ever did. The difference is I got hurt. I could have let that define who I was, but I, I didn't allow that. So I've, I've rewritten my story and used a negative, and, and I'm making it positive. I was born at July 16, 1984, and lived primarily in Kansas and Missouri my whole life. So I graduated in 2002. I didn't immediately enter into the military. I went to college for a couple years. My brother was in the Marine Corps. I was gonna follow his footsteps. But uh, when I went to the Marine Corps, they couldn't guarantee me a, you know, a job, a position. So I went next door to the, the Army recruiter and, and I made it right in on, on that side. And so June of 2004 is when I enlisted in the Army. So at that time, uh, I had a young son, and so I knew that I needed to be close. I, I mean, I wanted to go active duty. That was my, my I was set on that. But uh, knowing that I could be in the Army and it'd still be, still be around my son. And so, and that's why I joined the, uh, the Army Reserve. I enlisted in the Army Reserve unit in New Century, Kansas, it's the, the Chinook helicopter unit. I was a 15 uniform is what I, what I enlisted as, uh, Chinook helicopter repairman. Basic training was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. After basic training, you have to report to AIT, which is, that's where your school, that's where I got my wings, and that was in Fort Eustis, Virginia. <laughs> So there was an earthquake in Pakistan, and that was a humanitarian mission. So we got called up fast. It was a quick turnaround on that. So we got mobilized, and then we went directly into Afghanistan for the combat mission. It was the end of 2005 to the end of 2006. And then 2009 was, the, uh, was Uganda, Africa. That was the humanitarian mission to Africa. 
So sometime before the, uh, the Africa trip, I converted to the, to the crew chief side of things. And so when I went to flight, I, it was Bravo Company 7 of the 158 Aviation Regiment out of Gardner, Kansas. The Chinook has uh, five crew members, two pilots, uh, and then three backseaters. I, I loved flying, especially night uh, under goggles. That was my favorite thing ever. So we deployed in 2011 to Afghanistan uh, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. We went directly into Fob Shank and that was cold, it was in the mountains, it was small, and it was a target. Extortion was the, was gonna, that was going to be our, uh, the call sign for our company. June 25 was the day that, you know, my crash was. And so we traveled from Shank to Jalalabad for this multi-day resupply, infill, exfill of troops type of event. I remember bits and pieces of it. And that's generally the difficulty that I have with, with telling my story, right? It's almost as if I'm telling somebody else's version of my story uh, without, without certainty. I recall the briefing, I recall going to the chow hall, uh, getting some food and then heading out to the aircraft. The five of us were out there and we snapped some photos and little did I know that would become like the infamous image for us and for the other Extortion 17 crash. The crew of the five of us from Extortion 17, we've got Brian Nichols, uh, Kirk Heikendall, Buddy Lee, John Brooks, and then myself, Zeke Crozier on the, on the far right. The Chinooks, help, it's big, you know, it's a target, and so we lived at dark. Plus you wanna get, you wanna get these guys when, when they're not alert and, and awake during the day. So we had some ground guys, infantry. Um, the mission was to uh, infill troops into LZ Honey Eater. Um, it was really windy, it was really dark, uh, zero loom, and you're under goggles 100%. It's a full house, I mean, and so, obviously the Chinook has two engines, but uh, at that altitude and that much weight, it's not gonna operate with one engine. And so, I was on the ramp, my job was to clear the trees and clearance and then, you know, clear to come down. The terrain at where we were landing was was a mess. It was rocky. It was, you know, uneven. You get trees. Uh, we passed the trees, and I said clear to come down. And then I called the RPG at the six o'clock position, and, and I thought it missed. And then I called out small arms. Again, I wasn't certain if it hit us or not. Uh, Buddy had said that he went to pull thrust and pull power. Uh, to level uh, to pull back up and uh, the the number two engine was pegged. So basically the number two engine we lost that that was the side that the RPG and the and the small arms uh, you know was coming from. It's estimated that it's somewhere between 100 and 150 feet that we dropped. Uh, I was on the ramp. I was tied in, connected from the helicopter to to my back, and so I got thrown around when we, when we landed. Um, I was knocked unconscious, and so somewhere on the ramp is where I was laying. Uh, I'm not sure how any of the guys got out um, other than the ramp, but I imagine them all climbing over me out the back of the ramp. Blessed to have a couple amazing pilots, the way that they managed that and held the stick, but they landed flat and everything that was supposed to happen on the helicopter did. The fuel pods, they popped off, and then the aft pylon rotated around to the right side the way it's supposed to. You know. Whether it was part of the pylon getting ripped off as well, but it just like it's like a can opener, it just kind of peeled the the roof off the the backside. Everybody, you know, rolled out, rallied up, and then they found out. I guess at some point they said, "Hey, where's Zeke? Zeke's not here." So they all had to come back and find me. I guess my ear was bleeding from what they said. Uh, they said my left leg. They splinted it because they thought it was broke. So the impact went to the right side of my head affected the left side of my body, and so partially paralyzed immediately. One of the squad leaders, he said this, he said, we saw that guy, that guy was on the ramp, he died. He was dead, they thought I was gone. I think initially they said there were like three or four heroes. To be considered a hero, it means you're gone. So I was called a hero initially. It's pretty amazing that, that no one was killed in this crash, especially seeing the photos. 
they called in another Chinook. Uh, myself and Kurt Kaikendall on the right gun. He was injured pretty badly uh, as well, and so him and I both were met medevaced out. I was uh, taken to Bagram, Afghanistan, and then from there I was sent to Lansdale, Germany. And then once I was stable enough, they sent me to Bethesda, Maryland. When I was in Maryland, I was essentially in, in a coma. That's where Lacey and my mom met me. Once I was well enough and out of the coma and ready for some kind of rehab, I was flown to uh, the VA hospital in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You excited to be out here, Z? Basically, it was like I had a stroke. So the left side, my muscles would drop, my face drooped. Uh, I had to relearn my motor skills, um, walking, speech again. Um, and so that's what I suffer from is a traumatic brain injury and, and it's unseen, right? I still appear and look like I'm normal. In the beginning, I was in rehab all day long. I would still wear the uniform, I'd go to, to my duty station and then I would go to CBWTU, community-based uh, warrior transition unit. And I was initially temporary retired. It's TDRL, temporary duty retirement list, but also dealing with like surgeries. I had a surgery on my hand um, and, and just going through treatment, things like that, until they could finally get me through the med board. What am I being judged on? How I was initially, right? How bad was my injury initially? Or was I being judged on how I looked, how I was starting to look, because I was starting to appear like you look fine. Oh wait, you were a helicopter crash. So the process being retired out, uh, it was difficult. And anytime you tried to apply for something, a program, assistance, uh, one of the first questions they ask you is, Do you, are you a Purple Heart recipient? And I'm sitting there going, I, I think I should be. And so I needed help getting my Purple Heart. So I went into his office and that picture was on the wall. I met uh, Congressman Kevin Yoder before my first deployment and that's where that picture was taken. And I was like, hey, that's me. So. Little did I know that I'd be going and see him after my second combat mission to Afghanistan. And uh, he helped me get my, my benefits and my Purple Heart. They completed the med ward and of course I was 100% medically retired. 29 and being retired out of the Army, um, I thought that was my purpose. I thought that was what I was going to do the rest of my life. I was, you know, I was going to be a, a lifer. Now I have to find a new vision. and. I've always had that, the mindset though to, to not give up. So after I was injured, we uh, ended up getting a lake lot. People kept throwing bottle caps around on the ground and so I was just trying to police everything up and get it in one place and so I just was messing around. I went to go sm you know, hit, a, hit a bottle cap with a hammer and I totally missed and it made me angry. And then I realized it was making me hit a consistent spot, location, multiple times and so I ended up smashing all these bottle caps nailed all the bottle caps down uh, and into this incredible piece of art, I suppose, if you want to call it that. I started messing with epoxies and then I got into resins. I think it gave me a, a purpose. Handicapping that came about because I was sitting in a handicapped spot with my permit and trying to put a name together and it just, the name came, Handicapping. Uh, people wanted to purchase these things and so it was like, here's my, my outlet for, for, you know, income. And then as my story continues on, I want to help people, right? And so now Handicapping has become an organization that can create art and that the money, the income that's generated from selling my art, auctioning it off, that can be gifted basically to the other, to the organization or nonprofit and impact and affect lives. So Lacey and I met after my first deployment so we had both of our kids. Uh, I've got three, oh, this boy is 16. Um, Chase and Gunner, Lacey and I had, had them uh, before my last deployment. When I got hurt, we weren't married, so she really didn't have any, any say. And so the obstacles that she had to overcome to get to even to get to the point of being with me in the hospital, but the fact that she wanted to be there and, and fought to get to that point Meant, meant everything. The joke is that it took, it took me getting hit in the head for me to decide to get married. We were in uh, Minneapolis is where we were at. 
and she signed me out on the on the board on the sign out sheet from the hospital. We went to the courthouse. So we got married in 2011 uh, when I was in the hospital. There's two extortion 17 crashes, and part of my legacy is to to honor the fallen and. Uh, Every time I get an opportunity, I like to talk about the other crash, the other Extortion 17, the true heroes. And so Brian Nichols was the pilot on my crash. He was uh, also the pilot in the other Extortion 17 crash where they were all killed. So that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, I think that's why I have the passion to continue with what I'm doing now and you know my art and, and remembering them and honoring them any way that I can. Uh, I'm a Chinook guy. Um, I'm proud of being a hooker, that's what they call us. Once you're in the hooker community, you, you're you part of that community, and it's a, it's like a band of brothers. So it looks like we're about 30 minutes ahead of the schedule with our airspeed. About 100, 100, okay. I'm sure we're making a thousand miles an hour. Zeke, why don't you go ahead and come forward and kind of bring us up to date on what you're working on today and kind of going into greater detail about how you got through some transition challenges. Good evening. So this is unscripted, um, as is war. If I could everybody just stand up for a moment, a many moment of silence, we lost some uh, the Marines is playing today in, uh, in Afghanistan, so it's one of them. Thank you. This never gets easier. Uh, it's like, uh, it feels like yesterday, even though it's been 10 years. Uh, the only thing that's been uh, improving is then how I look. <laughs> um, my lows seem like I'm, I'm getting better and there's nothing wrong with me at all. Uh, but nothing changes. I'll never forget it. Um, so, uh, in 2011, uh, is when I heard, got, I got hurt. Uh, the other crash happened just six weeks after mine. Uh, the well known distortion 17 crash of the Navy SEAL guys that got them on. Uh, the flight crew of my guys, as that said. Um, so, it's a difficult uh, shadow to live in. Um, but I, uh, I do so by living my life, honoring. That many women that give their women to go up and sacrifice. Uh, they're no longer here. And that's difficult for me because uh, although I'm here in, in, in body, um, my mental state is still there. My mental state is still affected by that. And it's difficult. On top of that is my brain injury. Uh, you can't see it, right? We all have a story. We all have things going on in our life that you can't see. Uh, and mine was affected from that terrible incident. Uh, Mel, you like to jump out of uh, aircraft, and kudos to you, brother. I appreciate you, and thank you for your sacrifice. Um, I never understood that. A perfectly fine helicopter, and I was like, why would I jump out? <laughs> <laughs> but much respect to what you've done, and uh, continue to do as well. So uh, I had to find a new purpose, and uh, I believe things happen for a reason, although I don't always agree with them, or uh, understand them. I. Uh, what happened to me has become a blessing in disguise. I don't, if I didn't do it all over again, I would, even on the, the, the end game, right? The injury, the, the things that I've had to suffer from and put my family through as well, I would, I would do it again uh, because of the impact I've had, how I've grown uh, and matured and things like that, and the, the kind of impact I can put on the community and the people right now. Um, so uh, I found a new purpose through bottle caps. I never dreamed, right? Growing up, I never been a passion. Like, I'm going to be a bottle cap artist, right? Uh, things happen for a reason. Uh, I get hurt, uh, have a coma, relearn how to walk and talk, and then um, I'm handicapped, right? Uh, I'm a handicapped now from the, from the naked eye, right? So that, that, that's where this is going in and out. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, then I found this bottle cap outlet. Uh, it was therapy for me. That was that was there for me. And then I learned that I could use this as a method of raising funds and, and growing awareness, things like that, uh, to help other people. So now I, I, I did a, a piece here a couple years ago uh, for Folds of Honor. They're local. You, you're aware of that, I'm sure. 
and my wife raised ten thousand uh, dollars for Folds of Honor, which is incredible. Uh, I lost my my bearing that evening. Um, that two scholarships uh, for dependents of fallen military and first responders, uh, and then I just had an event where my my wife raised seventy five hundred dollars up in uh, Ohio to help children of of fallen military. So. Uh, to me, that's serving, continuing service after my service in the military. So I, I'm continuing my service by helping other people, actual lives. That, that's what matters to me is how can I help somebody else. I've lived in a, a black hole for years. I still do, right? You don't see it because I look like I'm fine right now, but we all have a story. And, uh, and I struggle. I have many struggles. My art is my therapy, but what I can do with my art is how I, I feel better every day and it fills my cup and I can help benefit other lives. Uh, so that's what I do. and. Uh, I've got a couple pieces of art back there. So once this is over, you can go, go check it out. Uh, it's next to Mel's table where I would buy one of his books, so I throw them too. Uh, I recommend you all do the same. Um, so uh, please check it out. Uh, the story is bigger than what it is, and my memory, I get in the head, so as far as remembering details, right? That this, like I said, it's unscripted. I don't. I wish Emma would have given me some notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, whatever comes out comes out. I'm authentic and I'm humble as crap, and I, I just I have a good heart, and I'm trying to break that stereotype of young individuals that look and appear like they're punks. I'm not. I'm a damn good person. I know it, and I just want to help those people any way that I can. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop at that right there and, and move move on. Thank you. One last speaker this evening, and that is going to be Emma Toops. She is an Iraq and Afghanistan combat vet, and her transition story includes coming home after service in Afghanistan to an unexpected early retirement, and personal transition challenges of having to create a transition plan in six months or less. Um, we don't have a film for Emma, um, but she will verbally share her backstory and kind of bring us up to date with what she has been doing and her purposes and her coaching and advocacy that she's been doing. And this is also illustrate uh, that there are future programs, uh, our guest speakers will not necessarily be practiced public speakers, have a documentary or have found a new purpose that has had them actively engaged in military and military support community. Emma is practiced telling her story and new purpose because she is a transition coach. And the mission of American Warriors, which is what we're a part of, is to support those in transition from the military. So Emma, let's hear her. Thank you. All right, so the pictures in this slide, the one with me and the other woman, that's us in Afghanistan. And uh, we're actually in an event where we're getting um, recognized with a ribbon, our NATO ribbon, because we're getting ready to come back. Um, the other one is um, a recent one, Headshot Business, where, because of an executive VA that I just finished. But my expectations for my military career was that I would, uh, the next slide. Um, what was that I would get promoted to lieutenant colonel and on my own initiative retire with 20 or more years of active duty service. I started my career in 1996 and that time frame of 1996 to 2011 was my active duty service period until the beginning of my transition story which began in 2012. So I was deployed in 2012. At the end of 2011, I was assigned to a unit overseas in Germany, and 5th Corps was the unit, and we received deployment orders in November for one year, one year deployment in Afghanistan. And at that period of time, I was already getting my board file ready for my first look to Lieutenant Colonel, which the, the board was going to meet in February of 2012. Because of the train-up period going, you know, that we knew that we were going to be doing, 
I had to do all of that preparations for my board file before the end of 2011 because then there were just all the pre-deployment train-up stuff that was going to be occurring. Um, and we deployed in 2012 in May. My board met in February and we deployed in May. We expected the results of the board to be released in the middle of June. And so I'm, de I'm downrange and doing my job as the uh, Fragile Manager of an operations, uh, sec operations center in NATO. The NATO headquarters were actually is in Kabul. And um, the list didn't come out in the, in the middle of June. It was really late. People didn't understand why. And it finally was released at the end of July. So it was over a month late as far as it coming out. And I fully expected to be on it. Uh, my career up to that point had been very successful. I, uh, I was a senior major at this point. I had pinned on in 2006. And I wasn't on this list. And it was a complete shock. Most of the time, a significant emotional traumatic event is not something of this nature, usually it's because someone you know has been killed. But I was downrange when this happened. It was traumatic because it was completely unexpected. And um, I didn't know what the reason was for it. My senior raider was the two-star general of the operations center. And a couple days after the list came out, he called, that he had me come and see him. He wanted to check on me, just you know, see how I was doing. And something that was interesting in this conversation was he informed me that there is a reduction in force occurring right now in, the, in our army, and the promotion system has changed. I think there may be a mistake in your file, which was confusing for me. I didn't understand what he meant. And he said, Emma, in a reduction in force, promotion boards don't meet to find out who to promote. They meet to find out who not to promote. And a lot of the time it's because of mistakes in your file. I think you should have been on this list, and you weren't. So I think you might have a mistake in your file. He told me he understood the changes in, a, in the system because of the rift, because he was passed over for the first time in the last rip, which was in the 90s. He's a two-star general when I know him. So <clears throat> he survived it, apparently. So I did take a look into my file. I did find a mistake. I, I didn't know if that was it. And, uh, and he, um, he encouraged me to try to correct it. There wasn't a lot that I could do while I was downrange, uh, but I did what I could and did it the best I could to be ready for the next board, which was in February of 2013. What I really didn't understand was that the system has significantly changed. Next slide. So fast forward, February 2013, the, the board met again, and I redeployed to, or to Germany in April of uh, 2013. I expected to be on the list because I thought there was still a good chance uh, that I would get selected in my second look. The list did come out in June, mid-June, just like it was expected to be, but I wasn't on it again. So in the military, when you don't get selected for promotion two times in a row, in the normal system, there's one more chance, and it's called uh, selective continuance, and you just continue to serve without any further promotions. And so I thought that might happen, but I was now very, very concerned about my career. I ended up calling my branch manager, which is the, uh, the person who manages my assignments, and he told me something that he couldn't tell me a year ago that the system had changed so much that one look was all you got. There was no second look, even though your file was in the board, but I also learned that my branch, which is very small, it's 
chemical, we were over strength at Lieutenant Colonel. And so that, and you really only get one chance in the system that we have now. That told me my career's ending and I wasn't ready. So I was on this emotional roller coaster. I was angry, I was confused, I was really worried. I, I started having a lot of self-doubt as far as what did I do? What didn't I do? Who did I know? Oh geez, maybe someone I knew who, whatever. But I, I was in this little pity party of trying to figure out why and how of where I was. And it was my sister who kind of snapped me out of it. I had to make phone calls to my family members over a few days because I was just too emotional to be able to do it all in one day. Plus I was in Germany and my family was in all different time zones. But my sister who is a civilian, I'm telling her the story. I'm, I'm telling her the what a shoulda coulda of whatever conspiracy theory I had as far as why. And she was like, Emma, it had nothing to do with you. The system changed and you got laid off. And it was those words of you got laid off that snapped me out of my pity party. Because that was never a phrase that we would ever use in the regular system that I had had my career up to at that point. And I realized that she was right. The next bullet on there as far as the Dear G.I. Jane letter. So this is kind of bottled off of a Dear John letter. You think you're in a good relationship, but then you get this letter that says, sorry, honey, I'm breaking up with you. And that's what I actually got from the government. At the end of June, I got a letter from the government that basically told me I had four options for getting out of the Army. I had an old later than date for when I would do this. <laughs> uh, that was uh, November 30th of 2013. And I got this letter at the end of June. Two of the options were kind of non-options for me because one of them had to do with um, having prior service as was enlisted and I did not. The second non-option was just to resign and say, bye-bye. And I had too much invested in my career to just say, bye. So I took a look at the other two options, and one of them was to resign my active duty commission and go into the reserves. It's actually a different commission. And then continue to serve until I was eligible to retire and, uh, and retire as a reserve officer. The other one was to retire early. And something that I learned in investigating this option was that the Temporary Early Retirement Authority was put into place specifically because the government was drawing down our military. Because the system had changed, opportunities to continue to serve until you were actually eligible to retire was no longer an option for a lot of people. So investigating those two options, I chose to retire early. So I retired early as a major after 17 and a half years. With my focus forward as far as what's next, I still didn't know what that was going to be, but it got me moving to what is next. And uh, I, I learned a few things with, um, with the transition challenge, transition planning. I had like very little time to do it, but I was in Germany at the time, so I had to kind of get my butt back to the States and when I finally did get back after doing everything that I needed to to finish up what I needed to with the, the unit and uh, get back, it was it was beginning of September by the time I got back to the U.S. And so I I literally had 89 days before my gotta be out date, and 
I had to decide if David and I were going to move, if we were go what job am I going to try to pursue, um, and and all of that in less than three months. I was doing stuff while I was overseas as far as networking online, looking at opportunities and whatnot, but I really kind of didn't get focused into all of that until I got back. And I was able to find an opportunity by being focused and um, by my time period there at the bottom of the slide of 2014 to the present, I've been an entrepreneur from, from the very beginning. I chose to go into entrepreneurship because continuing to work for the government didn't seem like a really good idea, right? So I get back in September and there was actually a government shutdown in October for a month. So I was like, okay, private sector, here I come. And I, I ended up going into insurance. And I learned a lot of things in building my business that then prompted me to do what I do now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is in, um, in the next segment of the program because this is part of the reason why American Warriors is a group here at the club. It's also part of the reason why I, I started the Purple Connection and this work that I do as a transition coach. My affinity to the military and the, the transition challenge inherent in that I realize that there is a paradigm of transition that everybody, it's a process that you have to go through. And you can, you can accelerate that process if you have these components. Next slide. So I use an analogy to a jigsaw puzzle. Military tra transition is like a jigsaw puzzle. And this picture kind of is representative of my life in June of 2013. It was laid out on the table, but it didn't look like anything. And I didn't know how to put it together. I didn't know how to solve it. Next slide. Solving the transition puzzle requires you to first have a picture. My problem when I was in Afghanistan was a non-select for the first time was my picture my expectation was that I was going to get promoted and that I was going to retire after 20 plus years of service. So that picture was the basis for my focus and my energy. I went through all the whatever to try to correct what I thought might be a mistake in my file and I, I didn't understand really what the system was any longer. So the, the edges of your puzzle are based on the picture that you have of what you're trying to achieve or trying to get to. The first two edges are focused on you. You have to know who you are as far as your identity, what is your, what is it that you want to do as far as the work, and then the second edge is purpose, it's why. When you're a service person, the why is kind of given to you as far as being a service member, we're serving the country, we're the strength of the nation, and, and whatnot. But then the other two edges have to do with the environment, have to do with rules, which I didn't understand at the time, and the behaviors necessary to be successful, which I, again, did not understand at the time, because my picture was what it was. Next slide. So the picture allows you to see potentially what it is when it's done. It gives you focus for putting in the pieces. You literally put a frame around it so that you are more intentional in the how, how you solve it. And it gives you no points or references. If you have a picture of what's next after the military service, it gives you something to focus on as far as who do you need to talk to, who do you need to meet, what resources do you need to have to get there. So a picture is really important. Next slide. Personal identity 
This is a big challenge for service men and women because so much of their personal identity is, is wrapped up in being a service person. And so it's the work that they, that they do, the missions that they perform, the skills and experience associated to that. But this part, identifying what is it when you're no longer a service person, this can be a big barrier as far as what's next. It includes what you believe in and your values because that is what drives your behaviors. It kind of fuels your passion. This is your why. Or it part of your why. Next slide is the why. Purpose. Why do you want to show up to do that work? Why is that picture what you're trying to get to? What impact or result are you trying to achieve? Why? And if the why that you define for yourself doesn't give you energy, you're not excited about it, you don't have confidence about it, then it's actually not a really strong why for getting you onto that next thing. Next slide. Governance has to do with rules. You have to understand expectations for how do you show up in that space. I didn't understand how the system had changed when I was in Afghanistan. I knew that it had, but I had a two-star general telling me, here's what the situation is. You can survive the rift. I did. I did what I thought I needed to, to be selected and, and fulfill that picture that I had. But I find out the next year that was a flawed understanding of the system, the rules, the expectations for how do you show up to be successful. So administration and culture, rules and behavior. Next slide. And culture is how you actually show up in that space. How do you engage in language and in, and in appearance? What are the standards of performance? Our standards of performance in the military is average is absolutely not good enough because the standard is excellence. Is that what it's going to be in this next thing that you identify? Or maybe you haven't identified what that next thing is. But recognizing that every environment has a culture and you as an individual has, have no authority to really change it. You have to adapt to what it is. And if you show up with, with discrepancies to the expectations of that environment's culture, at the end of the day, you are assessed as the one that's wrong, the one who is doing it different and weird, are you or not? In your mind, you're not. But we're talking about the space that you're showing up in. Next slide. So transition is a process. Everyone goes through it, and it depends on each individual how quickly, how, more, how difficult or not it is. I happened to go through the transition planning process at lightning speed. Most people do it over a year or two, and then once you're out because of all the planning, the actual living through the transition is a little bit easier. I was in transition for probably two and a half, three years after I got out because as I was learning and building my business, I was, I was adapting my language and my behaviors as I learned things of the culture and governance of the new space that I was in as an entrepreneur. I give a lot of credit to the business club because I was very, very new to the expectations of business ownership, marketing, <laughs> um, networking. All of those things were new as far as the environment. But something to consider as far as when you know people who are in transition or planning for it, 
The first two edges of your jigsaw puzzle frame are the most difficult because you have to do it. You have to understand and identify what it is that you want to show up as. What do you want people to understand of you and why? The second half of the frame is a lot easier because you don't need to know those answers. You find people who already do know the answers. And you learn from them as far as what are the rules, what are the system expectations, what are the behaviors for success. Next slide. So that's what I would like to wrap up my remarks with. and. Uh, this is something that people who attend the Purple Connection recognize. This is a slide that is um, in that as well. And this is going to be the segue to us thanking more people. Next slide. Okay. We want to bring up a special guest to thank, and that is Sean Wynn. Sean Wynn is the executive director of Patriot Features and is who produced the two films that, that were played earlier today. And Sean, just a couple, couple minutes. Sure. Talk to us a little bit about Patriot Features. Sure. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate the chance to share about that. So Patriot Features is a uh, nonprofit and our mission is to create short documentaries of veteran service stories. Now, that focuses on combat veterans, but not every story on the website is a, is a combat story, but most are. And we're approaching uh, 82 documentaries right now, and uh, the really cool thing about that is 51 of those are World War II veterans. And so uh, we've had, as you can imagine, uh, quite a few pass away over the years that they've been produced, but you can still see local legends like uh, Max DeWeese, uh, who lives uh, over here in Overland Park. And he was with the first Marines that engaged the Japanese on land in World War II at Guadalcanal. He's 100 and still driving veterans to events when we need rides given. <laughs> so there's a lot of great stories like that, and uh, the mission of Patriot Features is really threefold. Uh, it's a gift, it's an education, and it's an archive. And so we don't ask for or take any money from veterans or their families. Uh, I tell people, hey, if you want a tangible way to say thank you to a veteran for the service, support Patriot Features because we're creating these and giving these legacy videos to them as a gift. Uh, no strings attached, we don't want anything. It's just something we can give to their family and make a pass down for generations. Secondly, it's an education. We just want to take a small part in trying to help new generations understand the cost of freedom in the words of those who paid for that freedom. And so we take a lot of veterans into schools uh, and do things like that. And you can imagine in this day and age, it's, it's hard to wake them up and say, hey, the reason you get to be a knucklehead is because all these guys on the stage paid the price for you to be a knucklehead. We love you, but you're still a knucklehead. <laughs> and so you need to you need to understand what got you here. And then uh, the third part of the mission is, a, is an online archive. And so if you want to see more of these uh, documentaries, you can go to patriotfeatures.org. And uh, there's a bunch of them on there. We've got Tuskegee Airmen, the, the gentleman who threw out the coin toss two Super Bowls ago when the Chiefs won, uh, was a black gentleman uh, named, uh, at the time he was Colonel uh, Charles McGee, he was a Tuskegee Airman, if you know that famous story from World War II. Well, I didn't know he was going to be there, and I was like, hey, I know that guy. So I went up to Maryland, spent a day with him in his house, and so he's on the website. So there's some great stories uh, like that that you might enjoy watching, and uh, again, just a privilege to be here with you all. Appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank everyone for their service, especially Mel and Zeke. I get to hang out with people I, I never served myself. So this is a small way that I can serve those that did. And being around guys like this and Andrew, who I talked to earlier, great honor. Uh, most of the country is sane. Contrary to popular belief, most of the country is still sane. And we support our veterans, we love our veterans, and we love our military. But it's the squeaky wheel, right? 
than, than, than most people here. So a shout out from Patriot Features to everybody that served. We're an awe, we're an honor, and we're grateful for all of your service. Thanks so much. All right, my side business is Jam Gifts by Emma, and uh, these are little personal items for you um, for your support of the event. The key fob is personalized, so Andrew Martin, take them, and for you, I'm in. So the key fob and a little pouch that you can put your earbuds or a USB, chapstick, whatever you need, um, and you can attach it to any bag as you like. Awesome. Thank so, you so much. Appreciate thank you so much you. for your support to the event. Thank you. Right. The next couple folks that we're going to recognize with a gift are our speakers. All right, I'd like to have Mel and Z come up. Thank you for your stories and opportunity to help us learn a little bit more about you know, your experiences. Uh, these are sling backpacks, so if there's one strap, you can wear it on either shoulder, and that one is neat because it's got his initials on it, and then... Um, yeah. <laughs> so their initials are embroidered on it. That is one of the features of the 31 bag is that you can personalize them. So thank you, gentlemen, for your for your participation in our program. Thank you. Okay. And our last slide for thanking everyone who was part of the event team. Okay, there, there's a lot of folks listed on here, and uh, our host is the club. Some of you may have met Brian, who is our GM. Um, Martin Hess, who's our president, he was here earlier, the marketing and support department of the club, as far as our uh, event announcements. Event production, you've met some of them already. Uh, DJ for sound, my husband David on the computer, and Sean for uh, the video, and then uh, me, and <laughs> me and Andrew as far as up here on stage. Food and drink support, thank you everybody. Uh, there's Sharon, Andrew, Mark, David and me, Scott, um, as far as gifts. Gary Bloomfield is a veteran who wasn't able to come. He's, he um, contributed some gifts that we will use in future events. And uh, other support, the interest group, Patriot Features, Bison Fabrications for our bird banners, and Kathy's Flowers for the uh, for the bud bases that we had um, on the on the food table. So those were contributions by La Cardoza and Kathy's Flowers uh, Roses Only. So lots of folks kind of behind the scenes to make the event happen. All right. Uh, I think we've got one more. Yep. Next slide. All right, so what can you in the community do? You know, the community is a, a big part of the military. It's honestly what makes or breaks a career in the military, what kind of community that soldier is in. And it's no different when you get out. You know, what kind of community is there to support? What kind of community is around to help a transitioning military member? And Emma and I, we've talked about it a lot. You know, a lot of times civilians ask that question. You know, how do I support transitioning military? How do I support a veteran? How do I support military? And, you know, again, Emma and I have talked about it a lot. It's having a community that listens, that is inclusive in the idea of support. Yeah. All right, so what we're gonna do next, we are going to 
say thank you to some of you. I think that we're kind of at the end of the program. So what's next? What's next is you can stay as long as you like, socialize, um, ask questions of our sponsors, our speakers, uh, learn a little bit more about each other. If you want to get future emails of our, our programs, uh, and also if you want access to the, to the recording, uh, make sure we have your email. Um, if you registered, we have it. But if you did not, then please make sure you get with Tony. He's got some things that you can fill out as far as giving us your email address, or you can just give us a business card if you've got one of those. Anyone who is a veteran who would be interested in participating in a future program, get with Tony also and um, fill out a card that you're interested, and I will get back with you as far as future program participation. If you're a business and you want to be a sponsor in a future, um, future program, then also give us your contact information. In the back, on the 31 table, there are a couple uh, bins. That is cash and carry. Those are just some examples of what some of our products are. They're bags, they're things to organize, uh, thermals in a personal or home. And uh, if you're interested in anything that's back there, uh, any sales from the display table will be to support our expenses of the event. So, I think this is it. All right. This is the end of the formal program. We are on to the post-program social. So thank you everyone for your attention and, and for being here. So eat up the food. Yes.